uh, um, managing director for design of uh, Finnish fund Citra. He, you describe yourself as an architect no longer focusing on designing buildings, rather designing decisions. Exactly. Exactly. Welcome. Great. Thank you very much. So let me put my timer on so I know when to shut up. All right. So I'm going to take a perspective that is looking at, from a design perspective, the question of innovation and the health. And behind these two terms, for me, is really a challenge about bringing design, and I mean this in a very broad and inclusive way, further higher up the decision-making chain, so to speak. So yes, we need to continue to focus on products, we need to focus on services, but more and more we need to get up and also help shape decision-making. And when you take this perspective, at least for me, I think there are two key questions that come up. When we talk about health, do we really know what the mission is? What creates better health? What's the nature of that mission? And do we really understand who the users are? And what I'll basically argue is that we don't know what the mission is, but I think we have some ways in which we can start defining what the mission is. And that the users are many. The, the traditional users, let's say citizens, uh, but there are also users that are communities, uh, societies, um, businesses, government employees on both sides of the service question and at all scales. So it becomes a pretty broad set of questions. I start by paraphrasing somebody in a poor academic style, not even referencing their name here, but this is Einstein's sentence and today's problems won't be solved by the logics that produced them. So, if, if you look at the question of healthcare, let me take health and put it into the healthcare debate, we certainly know that there are tons of challenges. And I think for the most part, most people recognize that the path we are on is not a viable path in the future. And it behooves us to imagine that the approach that got us here is the one that's gonna get us to a better place. That the approach that created the challenges we ha have somehow is able to think itself out of those challenges. So I want to share something, and forgive me because I'll use some material some of you may have seen before, but I'll try to cleverly repackage it so it looks all new. But I'll talk about the diaper moment. And, and it connects with a very basic two things. One is the uh, emotional aspect that the design can bring to decision making, and its connection to how stakeholders see the nature of the mission. So a, a new CEO entered an organization that did adult diapers. And the company was a market leader. And the CEO felt that they weren't doing a good enough job, in spite of the fact that by all the standard metrics, they were a market leader. And so what she did was she brought her whole executive team to the boardroom. She closed the door. She put beers on the table, and she asked everybody to put a pair of diapers on. And she told them that they would not leave the room until everyone's drank all the beer and gone in the bathroom in their pants. And so they did. And for the first time, they actually began to realize what the nature of the mission was. For them, the mission was about uh, optimizing supply chains. Uh, it was about material performance. Um, it was about cash flow. It was about many things. And they suddenly realized there's a whole other dimension that was hard to grasp in the traditional means of making sense, but that was maybe profoundly more important. The social impact, how does it feel, what is it like to live in that kind of context. And from then on, the culture in the organization changed quite radically. Suddenly they were innovating in a way that was defined quite differently. They had changed the mission. So I frequently sort of ask at organizations who want to innovate, have you had a diaper moment? Have you had a moment where you've been emotionally connected with the mission? So we talk about healthcare. Oops, we went a little too fast. But I think it's m more like sick care, ultimately. So I, I think one thing we need to really think about is how we flip 
and this is part of that logic question, is the logic that got us here defined the terms by which the debate is argued. And it's a question of health care. But if we were realistic, it's really about sick care. It's a system to, to treat illnesses. It's not really a system to create health. That's not its primary focus. It's two sides of the same coin, granted. But that's not its primary mission, even though we're clouded in this term, healthcare. And I think a lot of the challenge, as some of you know, these are some of my two favorite people, is the fact that if you look at government, where our team operates, you have the political as uh, sort of dimension to it, and you have the expert, the technical aspect to it. And so this is 2008, when Bush came out for the very first time and talked to the public about the subprime crisis. And he used astounding language around this, saying that it turns out because the man at the top of the pyramid was not aware, that there is a system out there, and he puts his hands to give it shape, and that when something happens in the financial sector, it's not just limited to the financial sector, it affects the whole system, and to his great astonishment, it affects people. Right? So from a political perspective, I think this, in a way, grasps the challenge that it's becoming harder and harder to understand what's the nature of the mission, how is the vision to be built and in an interconnected world where we're dealing with great complexity, this is very challenging. Now the flip side of that is Alan Greenspan being grilled in Congress, who basically says a similar story, with the exception that he had the idea of what this was. He had a model, he had an ideology, he thought he understood how the world worked. And by all measures, he was a monetary genius. No one would have contested that. And he said he had data for 40 years to support that his way of defining the world was actually flawed. So I think this just demonstrates how difficult it is, and I bring these two up because it's not a question about political perspective, it's not a question about uh, personal opinion, uh, it's not a question about intelligence. I think this just demonstrates the complexity of these challenges. So it behooves us to think that this way of working is gonna help us solve the healthcare challenge that can get us to health. So as many of you know, I've frequently presented this, I think cities that have visions try to create visions, for example. We'll talk about a nice place to live. I don't think that's a very compelling one. And as many of you know, I think Helsinki should be a great place to die. And the, and the reason for that is that we're having huge shifts in our dem uh, demographics. Right? We're, we're after Japan, the second fastest aging country in the world. And you have all these elderly people. And more and more, the question of death, the question of your last years of your life will not just be something that you will be left to experience later on in your life, but will actually be embedded in your day-to-day -day life. It will touch many, many things. And we are a very birth-centric society. We have all kinds of s metrics that define what good birth is, birth rates and health and this and this and that. I don't think we have probably any metrics about what good dying is like. And yet this is going to become more and more something that is going to be shaping our society more and more so. So a little bit like the healthcare and the sick care, these are two sides of the same coin, maybe we could begin to shift the balance the other way around too. And sometimes by changing a perspective, you're looking at the same issues, but from a different vantage point. And what if we thought, how would you design things from a death-centric perspective? What does it mean? What are the last 20 years? What happens between retirement? What happens in all those phases? And how would you conceive of a better society from that perspective. And I think a lot of people who are becoming more and more preoccupied about this would love to move to a place where dying is great. So it could be a competitive advantage as well, right? And think about all the industry you would stimulate, all the new know-how. So aging's become, I think, a very interesting question in our mind. We had a studio we did several years ago, and what the studio tried to do was actually take a very systemic and strategic perspective, and how would you rethink this issue? So what you see in the background is sort of a timescape from zero to later on, and what are all the bits that you could work on? What are the innovation opportunities there? Right? And really rethink things. Now, if you look at the political debate around this, it is... We have more elderly services, less taxes, because less people are working, and hence, that's an imbalance that's really not good. So this is a problem. But we frequently, as designers, like to take problems and see them as opportunities. 
So if we look at this group, increasing group of people that is so-called a problem, and we look at them and we define them in terms of the, our attributes, these are people who have a lot of knowledge, accrued knowledge. These are people who actually have, despite what we think, overall, quite a bit of wealth, a lot of wealth. It may not be all in cash. It may be in apartments and in other kinds of things. Right? So they have knowledge and cash. Now, if I'm an investor, that's a nice combination to have in terms of, for example, venture capital. Right? If I want to stimulate new things, I put money and knowledge together and I create new opportunities. So all maybe what we've gone wrong is we've tried to fit this aging problem into our peg or holes. We need to actually create new frameworks that enable the potential on that end of the spectrum. Oops. Sorry about this. There we go. So two things I want to kind of bring up, which is I want to flip things around, as you've kind of noticed here a little bit. Public sector. We have lots of cuts. We're going to have more cuts coming along. The public sector is really set up to think about how it can improve on what it has. It's an efficiency question, and it, that's what it's set up to do. The public sector is not set up to innovate. Now, you will find a connection between government and innovation, but if you look a little bit behind the surface, what it really means is government is thinking about what kinds of things it needs to do so that other people can innovate, businesses can innovate, and so on. But that question hasn't really been brought fundamentally, how can government innovate how it does things? Now. <clears throat> When you have budgets that are half the budget that you had yesterday, it forces you to radically reconsider what you can do. So this is this silly car example I've shared frequently. And the way I describe it is, is if I tell you you have a car, but I'm going to take two tires away and half the engine, it's, you can't make a smaller car. So there's a point where having less just is not possible to make something smaller. You have to rethink the relationship between the parts. So you need a designer, I would argue, to come and look at these components and say, we can make a motorcycle out of this. But you're putting things in a different relationship. You're not taking the same and just making it smaller. So I think this austerity question is important, and it's quite dramatic, but it's a huge opportunity because it will force government to radically rethink how it's doing things, not just focusing on improvement, what it's already doing. And there are already signals of this, I think, quite strong uh, in Europe uh, and in Finland. So one of the messages I want to leave you today with, and I'll continue this a little bit, is the notion of disrupting patterns of behavior. Organizations, individuals have certain patterns of behavior. I wake up, I have a cup of coffee, I do certain things. Organizations have a certain idea about how time is structured and meetings in a certain process. And that actually shapes more than we can ever believe the way we behave. And what we need to do is to get organizations and individuals to behave differently. So we need to disrupt patterns of behavior. That can happen by crisis, which is looming, or by other means. And I'll come to this in a little moment. Now, the flip side of this is the private sector, the business side of this. And I actually think the business side has a value challenge. Now, the, the public sector has that too, but I'm just trying to be a bit black and white here. Meaning, I don't think we've understood what creates value. What actually makes societies healthier? What actually makes people healthy? This is a very complex issue. Now, the challenge they have is even if we figure that out, the best scenario, if you really figure this out, you would not have, this is a utopia, sick people. You would just have healthy people. And by virtue of that, a lot of the businesses as they're structured now would not be viable anymore. I was in a hospital in the US where they're doing some very interesting and significant innovations around stroke care patients. And they're starting to be pretty good at this. They're having better outcomes. People are doing better. And by being more selective, they're actually selling less services. So they're doing a great mission. This is what people want to do, doing a better job with less resources. Now, I told them, you're going to have a real problem because you work within a corporate healthcare model, and the business side is going to be asking you, we don't like this. You're making less money for us. So we need to, on the business side, quite radically, A, understand what actually drives value, and B, align incentives that businesses have with that. And I'll just give you one very quick example, which is an interesting parallel here, in the energy sector. In California uh, was, I believe, one of the first states that went to a kind of budgeting model. 
So what happens on the energy side? As we all know, we need to use less energy, be energy efficient, and so on. And so then you have energy providers, but they're mostly businesses, and their interest is actually to sell more energy. That, like the healthcare dilemma, is not aligned. So you need to align those in the way California tried it was by putting a budget cap. They said, this company has this much money. And if you sell less energy, you get to keep the money that's left over. So suddenly, they inverted the, the incentive completely. And so this energy company went into people's homes and put energy saving devices in the homes as an investment so they would hopefully sell less energy. Right? But this is a pretty radical thing. And all I'm arguing here is while we need to work on products and services, if we don't align incentives, it's like being a salmon trying to get upstream. So the three things I want to focus on in the last about 12 minutes or so is on people, systems, and organizations. People's sort of perceptions of themselves and how we disrupt that. Systems, what is the mission about? How we organize things, right? This thing the Bush was trying to do this with. And organizations, sort of how, what is the culture and logics of organization? And try to make some connections between that. So, people. I think there's a deeply, deeply cultural aspect to this, which we don't frequently see because we live in culture. The same way we're not aware that we have air around us because we take it for granted until the day there is no air around us, we suddenly realize it was quite important. So culture has the same kind of characteristic to it. And in Finland, we have a big challenge because these innovation challenges that we have are deeply cultural. So when you look at people, look at the culture of those people too, because that will determine how they think about innovation. So in Finland, we have a very technocratic idea about innovation. Innovation is a chip, innovation is a little bit of engineering and so on. And I tell them, yeah, while it's that too, it's more fundamentally at the end of the day, it's a cultural issue. It's, it's, it's a question of what's possible, what's not possible, how do you see the world? Right. So the example I give is uh, in building technologies. We had uh, fire regulations in Finland that for 20 years, the last 20 years, have prevented us from using wood in buildings. And the reason was fire codes, because apparently wood burns. And in Sweden, here, you've been very progressive. You've had fire codes that have allowed you to use wood in buildings for the last 20 years. Because you say wood does not burn. And this is what I find just kind of phenomenal, is you have, I know you think we're different, but come on, we're pretty much the same. We're in the same climate zone, we're socioeconomically more or less the same. So you have two cultures that are basically the same, looking at the same technical facts on the table, right? And one culture tells me wood burns and the other one says it doesn't burn. So it's not about the technical aspect, it's a deeply cultural one. It's about how Finns think about risk and how Swedes think about opportunity. And when you think about wood and its relationship to the built environment, you begin to realize that there's a huge both economic and climate dimension to this. When you put wood in instead of concrete, you're using far less energy. Wood is carbon capturing too. So as you cut more trees to put in your buildings, you're increasing the absorption nationwide of carbon, which could make your country carbon free, which would be pretty radical. Right? So there's lots of implications, and you're stimulating your wood economy, which in both countries is dwindling, more in Finland than in here. So this is something that I fell upon again, because I was away from Finland, and it just hit me in the head. So this is a very classic Finnish statement, it's right up there. The fear of God is the root of wisdom. Kind of a bad translation. But this is something that's taught to everybody. So you can imagine what kind of culture this creates when we get to the organization side of it. It's a very rule-based, differences are not very tolerated, there's a certain way of doing it. Put on this, our history with Russia, it creates a culture which is very monolithic in terms of how it sees the world. So I want to tell a very short story here, and then I'll move to my last two points. This is a great article, and I'm terrible, as you saw with my quote from Einstein, referencing this one too. But it's in the New Yorker magazine, uh, and if you Google bell curve, um, you will find it. So it's a story of cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a condition where the lungs have difficulty absorbing oxygen. And I'm not a doctor, so I'll give you the wrong story, but just to simplify it, there's basically mucus that forms around the lungs, 
And basically, one of the things that you need to do is you need to figure out how you can get that off, whether through me medication or through mechanical ways. So the bell curve is something that I think many are familiar. If you took any issue and you looked at how statistically things are distributed, you would have a few great examples, a few really bad examples, and most examples are somehow in the middle. Okay? Now, let's go back about 30 years. There was a group of people who thought that they were the best. So this is about people's perception of themselves. This was the best hospital. This was the golden standard. It was the little yellow one. right? And they were people from Harvard and MIT, and they were the best and the best. And then suddenly there was one place that was saying, no, actually, we're better. That would be the green one over there. right? And, and no one really believed it, because the life expectancy at the time was about seven years. Right? So you would have about seven years. And the yellow people were actually delivering, I think, on average, 15 years. And actually, no one had died in care yet. So that was just going on and on. So what they did was the Cystic Fibrosic Foundation was set up to go out and actually measure. Go to different places and measure what is life expectancy. And suddenly, when they laid it on paper, the people who thought they were leading the pack realized, to their great horror, that they were in the middle of the pack. And they realized that there was this small hospital somewhere that was doing not just a little bit better, a radically better job. So there's a story about a doctor's visit at both places. At the best, the yellow, which is in the middle of the pack, and the actual best, the green. So in both cases, teenagers go to the doctor's appointment. And in the first case, uh, at, at the yellow place, that what's happened is that uh, the patient has not done what's called cupping. Cupping is when you tap the back of a person, and it helps sort of release things and gets the lungs absorbing oxygen. And so the doctor says, your, your, your uh, oxygen uh, uptake is not very good. You haven't been cupping, and reminds sort of procedurally why that's important. Same scenario in the second place. The doctor is actually not interested in explaining what they should do, to remind them what they should do. What the doctor is interested in understanding why. So the doctor engages in a deeper conversation. And it turns out that the girl that's going to this other place just started dating. And it was really difficult for her, socially awkward, to tell her new boyfriend that she needed him or somebody to cup her for half an hour, an hour in the middle of the day. So she was skipping that. And that was leading to her, her decline in health. So the doctor there realized that there was a social dimension and it could be a solution. And what they came up with was a a uh, pneumatic vest, a vest that compresses air in and out. And as the girl slept, that cupping could be done doing sleeping so that it would not interfere with her social life. Right? So we have two very different places. The yellow place is a place that's driven by adoption. To offend my country, probably the Finns are pretty good at this. If the rule says you do these things, we do these things. But at the, yellow, at the green place, they weren't interested in just adopting. They were understanding in the fundamental principles of what creates value. And they were willing to break rules and disrupt to actually find that. So what happened is when the yellows realized there was somebody far better, they started to create a network. And the yellow people would go to the green people and learn. And suddenly, they would adopt what they were doing. So suddenly, the whole bell curve started moving because the people in the middle were now adopting what was the best practice a few years ago. But because the green people are deeply motivated by understanding what really drives value, they will always find the next thing for innovation. And so this is an interesting thing, I think, where you can connect the question of people to the question of how do you move a whole sector or industry or system or whatever you want to call it. All right, so let's get to systems. This is probably a familiar drawing to some of you. This is a fantastic drawing. This is the US military did this drawing to try to explain the dynamics of the war in Afghanistan. And so this would help them make decisions, right? So it's a little bit in the Bush realm that somehow this is this thing here. Um, it's quite challenging. And I, I would argue on any of these big issues, we just don't have the tools. And I will argue that actually as designers, we have tools that we can adopt for this work in a much more profound way. So I'm going to bring you back to a project I did many, many years ago. And some of you may have seen this, around stroke care. And I just want to really narrow this down to two questions. So stroke, give you the really quick on this, is a disruption of blood flow going to the brain. You have a blockage in a vessel, and blood's not coming here. When blood doesn't go there, it means oxygen's not going to a part of your brain. And you can keep that part of the brain functioning for a little bit. But after a while, it'll just starve of oxygen and die. So there's a certain idea about time. 
Now, in 1996, the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, approved the first therapy for stroke, which was a liquid you inject in your vein, which dissolves this clot. And they took a very large population, and they determined that three hours was that time. They took the population and, in a way, took a statistical approach to it. Now, we thought when we were doing this project, which was looking at cradle to grave and stroke care, but I'm going to focus on just the issue of therapy. When should you give the drug and what's the best approach? That this maybe was not correct. Uh, one of the big challenges is that there is actually many kinds of stroke. Stroke is a very broad term. It's like cut. I, most of us have paper cuts, small cuts, all the time. And on rare occasions, we have a very severe, I don't know, chest wound. Right? Those are all cuts, but they're dramatically different. So if you take a population and you say, I'm going to study cuts, you're most likely to have those with paper cuts. And hence, what works will probably work best for people with paper cuts. And yet paper cuts is probably not the one that's driving value for you. It's not the one that's creating your deaths or long-term disabilities. So part of this challenge is actually taking a statistical approach to population. This has been part of the logic that has got us here that we need to start breaking to some degree. The other aspect related to this is no one actually looked at how much it cost, so we didn't understand what the incentives were. So we worked with the Boston Hospital, actually got real cost. There is no cost data on a lot of stuff in healthcare. There, you, people tell you there's cost data. It's reimbursement data. It's charges data. It's what the hospital gives you in your bill. But we don't know how much it costs the hospital actually to do this. And if it costs a hospital much less than what they're charging you, there's a huge incentive to do that. But if it costs the hospital much more than what they can officially charge you, there'll be very little incentive to deliver that. So we looked at one year in this hospital. Each little bar is one patient. The most expensive is on the left, and the cheapest is on the right. This is just an order of cost. And we wanted to test this idea. We can't just talk about cuts. So let's look at who has a small cut in the brain, so to speak, and a big cut. So the big cuts are going to be red ones. So we see that the red is all over on this side, and the blues are all over here. So we begin to see that actually these two things behave quite differently. All our deaths are in the red. All our long-term disabilities, which can be in the many millions of euros over lifespan, are in the reds. Yet we have a drug that treats the most common one. And this is some of the extrapolation of how the curve would behave over five years. Just cost. All right. And what people perceive as being the solution to the system, so we really actually haven't understood the dynamics of some of this system, but what's the perceived problem is everything's fine. It's just, it's just we need to just process and prove it. And where do we need to process and prove it? The problem is that people, you and I, aren't calling the hospital enough, and we're wasting too much of that three-hour window. So it's just a matter, let's get people to call quickly. And we thought, maybe that's not the major issue. Yes, some people are getting late, but maybe that's not the major issue. So we wanted to ask this question. So we took census data in the US, we put every single hospital that gave stroke care back then on the map. And actually, the first problem we bumped into is there is no single registry of this, because each state does its own thing. So there's no integrated approach to it. And then we said, how much of the population is within reach? So the short story on this is you have 30 minutes to get to the hospital, because it takes time for the ambulance to get. There's stuff in the hospital that has to happen before you get your drug. right? So 30 minutes, and now I'm going to show you if you were a bird and you would fly straight from where you had a stroke to the hospital, what's the maximum reach of 30 minutes, OK? So here we're plotting uh, more and more distance. So distance is a kind of proxy for time. In the US, you would drive 60 miles an hour on average. So we're saying 30 mile circles. This is very Euclidean, very kind of overly simplistic. But this gives you a rough sense. So those circles are, if everybody flew like birds at 30 miles an hour, the kind of range, the population that could get stroke care in the US. Right? And when you look at it on the map, the statistic, the kind of uh, hypothetical maximum is uh, about 45% of the population. If everybody in the US called immediately, 45% could theoretically get stroke care. Massachusetts realized this and said we need to make more hospital stroke centers. So they made a lot of them. And when you look at these curves, you can see already at 5, 10, 15 miles, so half the allotted distance, you're getting to about 100% coverage. So it looks like policy works. The problem is, is that there's two parts on the map that are uh, empty. That's Cape Cod and the Berkshires. These are two very popular travel destinations in the summer, for example. So census data, when you do this, is really good 
until the moment you leave your home. And when you leave your home, it doesn't matter anymore. So we wanted to know on top of this basic analysis, what's the effect of moving populations on top of this? No one's even asked that question. So we looked at extreme. As designers, we like boundary conditions. So what's one of those boundaries? National parks, and only the ones like Yosemite and, 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 and so on, that guarantee there's no stroke care within 30 minutes. And we wanted to see how many Americans are putting themselves out of care going to national parks. So there's a peak around the summer. And then we found out there's a yearly cycle to stroke. Most people are likely to have a stroke in the summer. So there is a, probably a coincidence of when your population is most likely to get a stroke, when it's most mobile and probably either out of stroke care or less knowledgeable about where stroke care is. So let's come back and now translate that distance to actual time, because that's what we want. So this is one of those circles you saw in the big map, right? And it's going to shrink. And we use the Department of Transportation in Massachusetts, their traffic data. And it'll shrink once for normal tri travel time. Okay, so which actually 30 minutes, because these roads are squiggly and there's lights. And it'll shrink a second time during peak in the morning. And why is that important? Because there is a yearly cycle to stroke, but there's a daily cycle, cycle to stroke. You're most likely, I'm most likely to have a stroke in the morning, because I change my posture and my blood pressure, pressure rises. So anything that's kind of loose in here will go boom and block a vessel. So let's see. So this is normal driving. This is actual 30 minutes under normal traffic. And this is when your population is most likely to have a stroke. This is your maximum reach of care. Right? So when you take this and you bring it back to the national level, we estimate about 10% of your population can get to stroke care if everybody in the US called on a drug that is about 12% effective, good outcomes. So you have population-wise 1.2% better outcomes on this strategy. And no one's questioning whether this strategy is good. And by the way, that 1.2% is the paper cuts. It's not the ones who are going to die or have severe chest wounds. So here you can just see we don't understand the principles. And I think design can come in to understand how different bits of information are put together and how is a new narrative created. So I'll end on this taking about a minute and a half. So organizations, this is actually from Brussels. I was there yesterday. This is where innovation happens in Brussels. So <laughs> it, 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 our organizations, as I said, deeply shape the way we behave. And we believe that government has a huge challenge, that it's not equipped, a mission that it's not equipped to deal with. It's not about improving. It's about radically redesigning a new way of doing. We believe that designers have something to offer in this equation. But if I go to my design community and say, hey, those, uh, you know, uh, government, they'll say, who are those weirdos in suits in government? And if I go to my public servants and I say, hey, design, they're like, yeah, but who are those weirdos in black? Right? There is a chasm between these two communities. So like after the war, the way that we created understanding between nations is we created the idea of exchange programs like the Fulbright. Because by being in another community, by being in a different organization, you begin to understand the realities and opportunities of that. You also begin to br br build bridges. So we've done that exactly that. We have a program where we're replacing designers for a year in public sector. We have two in ministries and two in, uh, uh, in uh, municipalities. And they become employees of that organization. Right? They're not our people. They have to be part of that culture. Because we don't think that design can happen to government. It needs to happen from within government. It needs to change the culture of government. We also need to create career paths for people, designers, to have that experience and understand how they can bring design skills to help the health challenge that governments are facing. So two very brief things. This is a great photo from China. This shows you a little bit of some of our challenges in planning, where governments plan top down. And citizens feel like they're not understood. And citizens resist. So the only opportunity in having a dialogue about how cities are shaped, for example, is in opposition right now. So we had a, one of our designers in Lahti, outside of Helsinki, a smaller city, work with city planning. We embedded her for a year. And her was to bring co-creation to city planning. Now, city planning thought that this was really just, we needed to just tell people better what we're doing. And when they understand what we're doing, then they'll love our master plans. Well, what happened is actually we need to engage people. We need to understand what is their vision of the future. How do we begin to integrate that? So she worked with citizens to actually help shape the brief 
that was the basis of the competition, and citizens were engaged through the competition process and got to choose who they thought was the best participant. And we had this traditional process on the other side too, which was the traditional professional jury, and they actually ended up in the same place. And people, citizens, were really delighted that they saw some of their insights and some of their visions were integrated in the solutions. Right? Because the way we do things, centrally planned, is not viable anymore. More and more of these city master plans are going to court in Finland because people are bringing that opposition. It's becoming too expensive for cities, just to be very blunt. So here's Sara working with some children. She worked with over 1,000 people in the city in workshops, online with a series of different tools to understand what they're engaged. Why children, for example? She had elderly, she had a whole bunch of things. And, and people in the city couldn't understand. Well, they're not going to make decisions. No, actually, they make decisions. Uh, uh, people in the food industry know this. Uh, people in many other kinds of industries have already understood this. So when you talk to these, they will actually ask questions. Very helpful. They'll be, uh, they, they don't have any taboos, so it's helpful for the process. But they also get excited about their community. They also have visions about, and they're going to be the future owners of the city. But they also go back home and have conversations with their parents. Right? And it's a way to begin to engage those people. So you have to think about these things very strategically. What are your different entry points to this? So I'll end coming back to uh, Jana. Jana is on our social services. So she is situated under the director of the Helsinki City Social Services. They have about 13,000 social services. The director told me when we launched this position, he's got 13,000 social workers. He does not need another social worker. He needs somebody with a different perspective to help them rethink their services. And she's involved in a couple services to understand how you would reshape them and bring those insights up to the way the organization is shaped, reshaped. So we dealt a service, we went into a service around uh, family care, and we redesigned uh, a website. Now you say, oh, that's really boring. Now if you look at the website right now, it tells you how the organization is structured. These are the departments, and so on and so on. Now, as a father, if my child is screaming, I could not care less about where different departments are. I need to get to the shortest route to care or support so that it can bring value to me. Now, if you look at the online world, there's a whole other s world which is all about that. Google is all about that. The way we interact on Facebook or Amazon and so on is all about actually making the fastest, most effective, the most valuable link between things. So could we take an approach like that? Could it be much more like Google? So it's basically a website where you Google what you need. There's, it tells you who's online, live, and you can have that direct relationship. The public procurement decision took four days to make, to do this prototype, and it was live within two and a half weeks. Now, this is a speed that I think is quite astounding. I would say some businesses would be challenged to do that. So I think we need to think about the public sector not as something that we need less of. We just need to use it more smartly. And it's a prototype. It's something completely new to them. It's a very simple website, and as we start getting user feedback, we're starting to develop that, and it's quite iterative. So there's many entry points in changing this organizational thing. So I'll just end on this. This was my catch of the year last summer in Helsinki. And next summer we have something, I hope that it's a little bit bigger. We're launching a kind of uh, farewell party on June 10th. Um, our team is leaving our fund. And so we want to, in a way, have an opportunity to share some of our learnings, but also to engage in a learning process from the community that, that is doing a lot of the active world. So if you're interested, uh, come visit our website. We'll be posting more information. You can sign up for it. It's a free event, June 10th, Helsinki. We'll have bigger fish then. Thank you. <laughs>